University of Edinburgh for our first presentation. Andrew will present findings from his study that he carried out at the time teachers were planning their new curriculum in line with policy demands. And in his presentation, he will show how measures of accountability influenced the decisions they made about curriculum design. Andrew, over to you. Andrew, you're muted. Andrew, you need to unmute your mic. Andrew. Yeah, sorry, the, um, when I started to share the screen, it um, shifted to a different part of the uh, uh, of my screen. So I hopefully can, you can see that. I can't see anybody else at the moment. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Um, but I'll start now because we are, we're on the clock. So this, um, thank you very much to Shirley for the introduction. Um, in this uh, paper, I'll be, in this presentation, I'll be talking about how school-based curriculum development was experienced and enacted by uh, curriculum leaders in Scotland, because that was the focus of this study. Um, and I think there's a number of things that have informed the, the work that I was doing and just trying to think about the background and in the reading around that I've been doing and I'm sure many of you are good scholars of curriculum work, you're aware that a number of people have written about um, how curriculum is taken up or considered by different teachers. Um, we've got David presenting here and I've heard him talk about this iron law of curriculum where it doesn't really matter what they're in a curriculum text, it, it never happens quite in practice. I think this point by McKernan is really helpful as well because this, this view that we have about this freedom and choice that we often have is often denied because of the prescriptions in curriculum documents. But I think as this uh, paper is going to show, it's not just what's in the curriculum text that has an impact on the way that people take up and enact different aspects of curriculum. Uh, policy in schools. So the aim of my study was to explore the interplay between uh, the different layers of the education system uh, and specifically consider how national and local policy had an impact on curriculum science uh, decisions made. And this again the way that Scotland operates sets up a particular context for that because of the, uh, the way that you know, things are organised in Scotland. So the um, and to kind of put this in a nutshell at the start, Shirley's already talked about how accountability, attainment and support for curriculum development is one of the key findings. That's so really school-based curriculum, of this that I did, school-based curriculum uh, making is it's all about this decision-making processes that go on by the um, school, uh, school teachers. And inspection frameworks play a very important role in this. And so that really, I almost seem to be more important than anything else. Um, and I think it's in Scotland, we, ha we have a school inspection framework. It's slightly different in the evaluation than it is in other parts of the world. But this document called How Good Is Our School? That was in place. That was the self-evaluation framework that schools used and also the, that the Her Majesty Inspectorate for Scotland used. And that did not change when Curriculum for Excellence was introduced. So the most, if not the most significant contextual factor for curriculum leaders didn't change, but the other expectations did and how they responded to that really showed that kind of pragmatism and their innovation to be able to do things differently, but still within the constraints and what was required. So I think it's already been mentioned that, you know, we, in Scotland, we had this newly developed part of the curriculum, which was health and wellbeing. Uh, and why I was really interested in how teachers were going to plan for that and particularly the curriculum leaders, because again, we had one of these instances where although there'd been some form of consultation, really we had curriculum policy uh, being developed at the top, but then curriculum making was really required by the teachers who you might sometimes be thought of as the bottom or again, that's a kind of phraseology I don't necessarily agree with in some of the papers that we see, but 
certainly the curriculum text didn't tell teachers what to do. It certainly gave them an awful lot of opportunity to think about how to do curriculum differently and required an awful lot of work on their part. So for every, uh, again, this is a key statement that was made in the early policy documents around curriculum for excellence, that every child and young person is entitled to develop skills for learning, skills for life, skills for work, with this continuous focus on uh, literacy, numeracy, and health and well-being. Now, why that was really significant was this: these areas, skills for learning, life, and skills for work, these phrases became the key drivers within schools and what they were considering to be important. And you can almost then see literacy, numeracy, and then health and well-being uh, put towards the end. Uh, and that wasn't how the curriculum leaders thought about it, but certainly they had that had an impact. Again, I think this study was relatively significant because we, we, we know quite a bit about curriculum change, the well-established um, areas of inquiry in physical education. And we had done quite a bit of research in Scotland about this general context uh, and some of the, but we didn't really know the sort of the sense-making processes that curriculum leaders engaged with. And, and that's what I really want to try and take forward. Again, thinking about the context, what was in the context, what was it that the teachers were looking at? Um, and the, the framing of the curriculum was really quite interesting, I think, in Scotland at that time. It was really geared at trying to get teachers to think from first principles, value teachers' interactions, make them uh, really harness that innovation and that profession that they had. Um, and this is very much all the kind of the discourse around this, but the reality of that was, was somewhat different, again, as we sort of already alluded to and we'll mention later. So the methodological approach that I took was to look at all the policy texts and, and documents, and there are a lot of them. Um, and then I selected one local authority because, as I sort of alluded to earlier, in Scotland, the government set the, um, the policy text, but there's 32 different local education authorities, and they're the people who are responsible for um, sort of deciding what happens within the schools in that area. They'll have an overview of what goes on with that, and then also school leaders are required to take forward that. So there's that, those different layers are quite important. So I wanted to see what happened within one local authority to see if it was the same in different schools or if, it was, if there were particular things that seemed to be important. I interviewed the teachers in a repeated way. So I had one lot of interviews, which was about what they thought about, what they uh, in terms of considering the, and how they interpret the documents. But then the second part was really uh, to get them to, um, tell me about exactly what they were planning, how they were doing it, and show me their curriculum documents and what they were trying to make. And that I thought was really uh, an important part. Like, that gave me particular insights into what they were doing. Um, I had three main research questions. What was the, that they had patterned, what patterned and shaped what they were doing? And I want to know how they enacted it and what they considered to be the contextual factors. Theoretical frameworks get people quite excited sometimes, and I was very much interested in this idea about how their individual agency, everything that was sort of being discussed in those policy documents, and we're trying to harness, how that was influenced by social context, and that led me to think about aspects about critical realism. And then also how they were talking about it and what they were saying, that helped me to analyze that through this kind of Bearcroft's work on critical discourse analysis. Tell you a little bit about the teachers and what they had. Um, so. I had nine different teachers and also they uh, interviewed the quality improvement officer for the area. It's quite interesting. These were generally quite experienced teachers. Um, it quite another point of interest was the extent to which they could learn from the previous jobs, and the previous posts that they had in other schools. So some of them, as you see, have had after their sort of period of qualification, had had four schools, some three schools, some two, and that had an impact. So some, sometimes they were coming from one school to another and wanted to put things in place, and other, other times they had to look at things from the fresh. And so I'm going to show you some slides now which are, are showing the kind of actual statements that they made. And this going back to this point about accountability and attainment. So you could see that the teachers were really quite concerned when they were in the process of curriculum making because they wanted to know what the inspectors were going to be looking for, what was in the inspection framework that would help them to think about how they were designing it and how, what they were doing. They wanted to think about the experiences the pupils were having, 
who were very concerned that if someone came to see them and had a look at what they were doing in action, would they think that was okay? And how would they know if it was okay? Well, that's to do with what the inspector would say. And again, this, this really just highlighted that, how that shaped, not just this one teacher's view, but nearly you know, all of the nine teachers. You know, the first school that gets hit by an inspection, things could change. But again, this was a really interesting point that we often think about the phrase of sort of policy borrowing. We think about other, uh, at a kind of a high level across different um, nations. But actually, these teachers were borrowing and sharing ideas across to try and help each other out and to think about what they were doing. Um, and again, this aspect about attainment, what mattered, they really wanted to do health and well-being, but doing health and well-being well, as far as the teachers were, going, were concerned, couldn't have any impact on what was happening in the upper schools. It's really important to point out that at this time, they were, uh, it was like a phased approach to the curriculum development. And so they were really thinking about what they were going to do with the first and second year of schools and not and that not have an impact on the assessment and attainment of the pupils in the high, further up the school. So again, the way that teachers were going to be held to account and other people in the school um, community talk about what they were doing, particularly the head teachers and senior management team, would, would whatever they were doing improve attainment or would it be a risk to it? Um, and again, I think this is this point about uh, we see from Dawn here, the, the challenges the curriculum leaders were having, they, they really didn't have any additional resource. They had a few extra in-service days, but the rest of the time in terms of thinking about what they were doing was all coming from their own efforts, uh, planning and considering what they were doing, talking to each other and, and thinking about what to do. So the key parts of the findings was that the context really mattered. Uh, this, this aspect of accountability, the issues of attainment and the, the support mainly from other teachers that we had uh, for curriculum development was really important. Then there was two related processes of curriculum development, a kind of a first order where they all were in, get really engaged in the documents, reading them very carefully, thinking about how to interpret that and then having to reinterpret what that would mean for them in their school. And then that reinforcement that some of the ideas that they had were picked up in the other parts of the policy document or the inspections or from the school uh, management team. And then that second order, what they were planning to do in, in school, that really showed how they were thinking about what was available in terms of resources, how they could design it, how they could do that. And that led to this kind of pragmatic innovation that they showed. To kind of map that out, to, to show you here that you know, this context for school-based development was a very nested and interconnected set of uh, events uh, and probably even more diagram more connections between these and is sensible to show on one slide but that aspect about accountability how they'd be accountable to the school management team uh, how the local conditions and contextual factors would have a play in that and oh, sorry my slides are jumping ahead here um, and how that that would pay, play out was really important again because the local authority had particular service um, uh, uh, target agreements and schools were expected to meet those. And then we had the national performance framework, again, that had an impact on the way that they thought about what was going to be a good success for criteria for doing health and well-being. And I think other people who are talking later will give uh, an indication of some of those aspects as well. But this idea here that health and well-being was a responsibility for all was really important to the teachers. They wanted to do this, but that also was about this skills for life, skills for learning and skills for work. So whatever they did in the PE curriculum, we're really going to have to address those things and help to promote health and well-being. So that really meant that they didn't do some of the things that we've read about in other um, nations where when health comes in, they started to move very much towards um, perhaps just seeing physical activity as being the key to what they were doing. Because of this kind of nested interconnected approach, really making sure that what they were doing was going to support I mean, they were to them to be accountable for attainment. Uh, became a, a key driver. And I think what we learned from this is that, uh, I've got about two minutes to go here, is that when you have a, a particular inspection framework and that doesn't change or the documents that are there, that's really important. Because out of all of the, the, the inspection framework, the curriculum was one area, but there was nothing in that 
that said anything about health and well-being. It said things about care and welfare, but nothing about health and, health and well-being. And that, again, gave the teacher some degree of freedom, but it also restricted what they could do. So the uh, local authority and school management teams, they were all working within a changing context, um, but there were no changes to this inspection regime. And I think if we had wanted to, and all the teachers wanted to know what was going to count. And I think that's, uh, again, we need to be aware that these teachers were really active in this process of curriculum change. They really thought about the experiences of learners. They were very, very engaged. And, but they, want, they saw PE as part of health and well-being to achieve the, the wider aims of the curriculum. So thanks for listening. Um, if you want to know more uh, or you have questions, then we've got time because it's a symposium. Um, you can, as young people say, or even some of us, we can tweet me and uh, find out more on Twitter. And uh, thanks very much. I'll pause there, stop sharing, and the next person can come on. Thanks, Andrew, and you were under 15 minutes. Well done. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce our next uh, presenters. So the next presentation is from Professor David Kirk Aralam and Dr. Aishin Teraoka from the University of Strathclyde. And the presentation is entitled Exploring and Developing Pedagogies of Effect in Scottish Secondary Schools. They're going to present findings from two studies that explore the PE pedagogies of teachers who've paid specific attention pupils learning in the effective domain. So Cara, I believe you're starting first. Um, actually, it's me. Oh, but David. Is, okay, uh, thanks, David. I'm in charge of the slides. Um, so um, away we go. I've got my chronometer on. Thank you very much, uh, Shirley. And thank you, Andrew, because you've provided a really nice context for us to start to talk about our research programme, which has really been developing over the last um, five or six years. Um, could you change the slide, please, Cara? Um, so the, the framing sort of theoretical approach to what we're doing is around a concept of precarity. Um, and this is work that I've been undertaking myself um, over the last three or four years, um, just been published in this book that came out earlier this year. Precarity, if you're unfamiliar with this notion, it's a concept that connects work practices associated with the, the gig economy, the so-called gig economy, short-term contracts, zero hours contracts, self-employment and so on with health and well-being. These practices foster uncertainty, instability, and incoherence in people's lives, and thus they have a, an adverse effect on health. The prevalence of precarity has been rising over the last decade, in particular in the UK, to the extent that some sociologists, such as, for example, Guy Standing, have identified a new social class, the precariat. Thanks, Cara. So we have a key question and a response. With its special responsibility in Scotland for health and well-being, how can physical education respond to rising precarity? Our response is to explore the possibilities of what we're calling pedagogies of effect, where effective learning is the explicit goal of school physical education. And within the, con the context of um, a curriculum for, uh, for excellence in Scotland, there's a, a, one of four significant areas of learning. It's called personal qualities. And, and this is where we find these, these um, effective learning outcomes. Thanks, Cara. So the first um, study we're going to talk about, we've got two, two studies to present to you. Um, and, and we're not actually going to have time to talk in any detail about the, um, the, the, the findings and so on. But we want to give you enough of a taste of these so that you, if you're interested, you can come back to us and, and find out more. The first is a, a mixed methods study of pedagogies of effect in secondary schools in Scotland. And this was conducted by Aishin Teraoka, um, who was um, my PhD student. Aishin is here. Hello, Aishin. I think it's probably something like midnight in Japan, or very close to it. Um, so we're not asking him to, probably in his jammies, so we're not asking him to come and present. Um, but I'll, I'll just give you some uh, a taste of his study. We actually had two studies within the project. The first one was an observation and analysis of teacher behavior and pupil responses, which was a quantitative design and the second building on this first study was involved self-confrontation interviews with teachers in relation to videos of their teaching. And we also had some pupil focus groups, uh, which was a qualitative design. So I'm just going to give you a retaste of mainly the first study, but a bit of the second as well. 
Um, we've grounded the, the quantitative study in self-determination theory. We use self-determination theory as a kind of proxy measure of, um, of the effective domain. And really, th this was based on two, um, two premises, that needs supportive teaching can promote positive effective learning outcomes. And secondly, that needs thwarting teach teaching produces less desirable um, outcomes. Um, for, so for this study, um, study one, the quantitative study, we had two research questions. Is teacher's behavior needs supportive and needs thwarting in physical education? Is it or is it not? And to what extent is their behavior supportive and controlling? We had 20 teachers, uh, 11 males and nine females. And so we used a purposive sampling approach. We actually approached teachers who had indicated a, a, they had a stated interest in teaching for effective learning. Remember, within the personal qualities, significant area of learning. We asked them to teach two lessons um, each, one a week apart, uh, one, one each a week apart. So we had two lessons from each teacher, 40 lessons. In terms of observing teacher behavior, and this is the only data that we took from um, the videos, we didn't uh, take any data from the, the children. Um, we used a need supportive and need thwarting uh, teaching behavior observation tool that's been under development at the University of Ghent, uh, led by Lane Harrens and her colleagues. We also collected um, um, data through pupil questionnaires, which I'm, we're not going to present to you today. Okay, so I think one of the really interesting things um, um, from, from Asian study is this graphical representation of teaching types, where we've got two axes. One is around controlling teaching, more control, less control, and um, that's the horizontal. Um, and the vertical axis is need supportive teaching, more or less need supportive. And you can see straight away how these teachers all of whom claimed to be interested in, in, in teaching in the effective domain, where they cluster around these, um, these, 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 um, these axes. Um, next slide, Cara, thanks. So we can see how that works out in terms of high support, less controlling, low support, less controlling. We haven't reached the stage of saying what is the ideal um, sector for teachers to be in who are teaching for um, effective learning outcomes. What this is indeed is a description of where these teachers um, fall out. Um, so this is them again, each of them now within those sectors that you just saw. And you see that the majority of them are clustered down on the bottom left hand side, which is the less supportive, but also less controlling um, approach to teaching. So that was the quantitative, that's a taste of some of the data we got from the quantitative study. Very interesting, but, but describing what it was we observed in those lessons. In terms of the qualitative study, um, the observation tool allowed us to assess teachers' um, behavior, but what were teachers' own intentions? Those were hidden from us, and so we needed to, to spend some time um, doing interviews with the teachers. Um, we wanted to know, these are the research questions for the second study, are teachers aware of their teaching behavior? And how do teachers explain their behavior? Um, so what we did in this case was we used critical incident analysis um, to identify critical moments from the videos of the teacher's behaviors. Where we're looking for critical moments in relation to needs supportive behavior and needs supporting behavior. And then we used these, sorry, Cara, we used these to prompt the, um, we showed, we sat down, uh, Asian sat down and he interviewed the teachers in what um, Amade Sco from the didactic tradition in France called auto-confrontation or self-confrontation interviews where we prompt the participants to explain what they're doing and the knowledge they use during the lesson. So Asian would ask questions like just tell me what's happening here, what's going on here. Um, and, and clearly we could identify, we, we, we did this with all of the teachers but you can see here um, one of the things we were interested in was were there different kinds of responses from teachers from different um, zones on this particular graph. Now, we don't have permission to show you um, the videos that we recorded um, with the teachers, but we thought it was, it was safe enough to give you a taste of what the teacher said as she was watching a video and, and Asian was prompting her to, to speak. Thanks, Cara. Uh -huh. She's not playing today. We try again. Okay, well, no, we're not hearing that. I guess you, you can read it in any case. Okay, so, and, and you can see in this comment, the teacher has been quite reflective about um, her, her teaching. 
and what she's seeing um, in the, on the on the video clip. Okay, Cara, over to you. Sorry, it was playing on my side of the screen, but obviously not on yours. Okay, so for the second part of this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about how myself and other teachers have used an activist approach for working with adolescent girls. So the key question here is, is it possible for teachers to learn to use a particular pedagogy of effect? The pedagogy effect in this case is an activist approach to working with adolescent girls, and this was essentially an intervention. So the approach itself was developed from the work of Professor Kim Oliver out of New Mexico State University, following her work of over a 20 plus year period with girls in physical education. In 2015, Kim, along with David, published this book that you can see here, Girls, Gender and Physical Education. And this outlines the approach itself, as well as the history and literature surrounding this work. The activist approach was designed to challenge the conventional narrative and it identifies four main elements, which I'll outline next. These critical elements have been documented to better facilitate girls' interests, motivation, and learning in physical education. So next I'll outline a little bit more about this approach. The overall main idea of the approach comes from Daryl Seedentop's work. It's about girls learning to value the physically active life. Next are the four critical elements you can see here. Student-centered pedagogy, which is, means students are part of their curriculum and how and what is taught to them. Pedagogy of embodiment. This is when learning takes place in a safe and comfortable environment that is free from judgment. Inquiry-based learning centered in action is when teachers and pupils together work to find gaps in their learning, which subsequently allows teachers to guide their pedagog pedagogical decisions based on this inquiry. And finally, listening to respond over time. This is when pupil, this is the kind of pupil voice piece where moments for debriefing and seeking pupils' voices are planned for and teachers can respond to this continually. And finally, there's the learning aspirations. So these are linked to the critical elements. So for the student-centered pedagogy, um, one of the learning aspirations is for pupils to be able to name, critique, negotiate, and change barriers to their participation in physical activity. The embodiment piece is about teachers and pupils co-constructing the environment to create safe spaces for learning. And they do this through kind of a, a class environment agreement. The inquiry part is about pupils having opportunities to analyze and destruct damaging myths and ideologies that are constructed in society as well as challenging, challenge the barriers they face with their physical activity, participation, and enjoyment. And finally, the listening to respond piece is a hugely valuable part of this approach as teachers fully authorize their pupils' voices and are able to drop down that power barrier. So the study took, this study took, was an intervention that took place over two years. And you can see on this slide a little bit more about the context of those phases over year one and year two. Year one was really about learning this approach. So Kim herself came and visited myself and four other teachers in Scotland and led workshops to help us learn how to use this approach in our schools. Each of us took one all girls class ranging in age from around 12 to 14. So second and third year of secondary school. And year two of this in intervention was my doctoral study field work. Um, three of these teachers, all of whom were head of, the, head of their departments, continued to use a, this approach with their classes. During this year, one of the teachers chose her fourth year all girls class, so around 15 year old girls. Another continued to use this with the class she taught during the pilot, and she also uses the new class of the same age, fourth year again. And the third teacher uses this with an all boys class. During my field work, I was in continuous contact with Kim. I was able to discuss with her what I was observing and also what I was coming up, what was coming up at the teacher interviews and pupil focus groups. So here you can see some of the key research questions from this work. So in year one, we really wanted to know if teachers can learn to use this approach in Scotland, or was this just a Kim Oliver thing? We wanted to know how Scottish pupils responded to this. And finally, what kind of things they struggled with, um, they struggled to understand, sorry, when they were using this approach in their schools. In year two, uh, we wanted to understand what teachers did with this learning one year on, or after the honeymoon period. We wanted to understand what particular structural and contextual factors they came up against when trying to implement this. And finally, we wanted to best understand how we can scale this up in a Scottish context. You've so I don't have time. Two minutes. 
I just realized this is the wrong presentation. <laughs> I don't have time to go over all of the data, so I'm just going to highlight a couple things. The first uh, was a number of themes that we developed, and the first was about learning what works and what others. Um, and that would mean that teachers were, would work against their entrenched values of ways they had or always taught PE. The second was teachers learning to become reflective. An example of this would be teachers learning to, learning to reflect on the structure of using that model in comparison to a multi-activity model. And the third was about teachers learning to be responsive to what the girls were saying to them, um, understanding about pushing the girls too far and that they didn't like that. And the fourth theme was about learning to see what possibilities that PE could offer their classes. So by looking at some of the education, educative benefits beyond sports as techniques, the teachers understood the realm of, of possibilities. So to conclude, and I apologize, I put up the wrong, <laughs> the wrong presentation. We took some things out and we had some um, papers there to show you, but I'll put up the right one in the, in the group. Um, so from Asian's study, we, we sought to determine to the extent to which teacher practice pedagogies of effect as naturally occurring. And we think that there's evidence to show that many teachers in the sample do so, but these are one-off and teacher-led. And from my study, where we sought to show the extent to which teachers could learn to use a specific pedagogy of effect given support and training, uh, we think that there's evidence to show that this is indeed possible, although there are some structural barriers such as timetable, tradition, culture, that make this difficult. Oh, and there's the, there's the publications, I do have them. And I'm just right on time, 30 seconds. So I will stop sharing. And again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat for us and we'll be happy to comment. Yeah, thanks to David and Sarah there. A lot to get through. So um, perhaps at some point we'll be able to share your email addresses and things. And if people want to get in touch to know more about your work, then they can do so if that would be okay. Um, so next up, uh, hopefully is Elaine Witherspoon from University of West of Scotland. So hopefully she'll be able to start sharing her slides and Elaine is going to share some of her work from her doctoral study as well and her presentation today is entitled Exploring PE Graduates Perceived Preparedness for Health and Wellbeing. As I understand more, less prepared I feel. Okay, Elaine, it's over to you. Thanks Shirley, I appreciate that um, introduction there and it was uh, interesting to hear the two previous um, presentations and their I think some links to context that Andrew spoke about and certainly um, some links to PE teachers and, and how they're working in school um, as Cara and David spoke about there. So as Shirley had indicated, this is um, from my uh, PhD work. I'm only presenting um, a small part of it, um, but I am going to talk to you a little bit about how this study um, was contextualised and, and how the, the, the data was gathered so that you can get a wee bit of context there. Um, so you can see there um, some of the key points um, that I drew on in terms of setting a context for the study and um, most of you will be aware that in the kind of current education climate that we have um, here in Scotland health and wellbeing has been given a lot of prominence alongside literacy and numeracy um, and we know that all teachers not just PE teachers have responsibility for that um, but for me I was particularly interested in PE teachers because it, it seemed as though from other studies and um, that perhaps that the shift had resulted in a, a greater responsibility for um, PE teachers and so what I was really interested in knowing was where our graduates um, who were coming out of initial teacher education re ready for that were they prepared to um, meet that responsibility and kind of alongside that um, there is obviously a, a kind of drive for um, teacher education of PE teachers being uh, adaptable and evolving alongside the priorities that change in society um, and in education. So this idea of preparation was, was really quite important and, and there are lots of people who talk about preparation um, and those were used to kind of contextualise the study that I did um, but essentially we were really, in, I say we, I was really interested in how they viewed their own preparation um, and what factors contributed to that preparation. Um, but we can see there that um, it is a real, really key construct for um, teachers um, in the sense that it can be linked to how they promote students' learning and their ability to do that. Um, and in particular, there are some research that suggests that the experiences that um, 
pre-service teachers get during initial teacher education and in their induction year um, can be a really important factor in, in terms of the, the preparation and how they're feeling about the preparation and, and linked to then how confident and, and capable they are um, in the classroom. So that, that idea of preparation was really important for the context that was um, setting the study. Um, you'll know that the GTCS standards obviously gives an idea of what we expect our students to be able to do um, and, and they were used to, to help design some of the um, data collection tools in the study in terms of what we expect our, our young student teachers to be able to do um, and then alongside that the literature um, which suggests that they need to be competent in the practical setting and they need to understand what they're, they're teaching and have knowledge of the curriculum but they also need to know how to deliver that curriculum um, to the young people in their classroom and, and so with all of those things in mind, um, I was really interested in knowing how do PE graduates define their own preparedness and, and what factors do they attach to their feelings um, of perceived preparedness um, and in, in their own um, practice. And to do that, I, I use a, a kind of mixture of methods um, in the study, and you can see there that the, the, the two, uh, sorry, the three um, ways in which I collected uh, data from the participants. Initially, um, there was a survey where they were asked anonymously to answer a range of open-ended and closed uh, questions. And then though that information then fed into the focus groups that followed. Um, and both of those um, happened at the end of their initial teacher education. So the timing was quite important um, because I wanted them to be able to think about how ready they felt, how prepared they felt going into their probation year. And then the interviews, which was the final um, data collection, was a year later after they'd completed their um, probation year. So they got an opportunity to look back on what had happened and what they had said in previous um, stages of the study um, and compare and reflect and, and, and give some consideration to their preparedness at a different stage in their career. Um, analysis was through interpretive phenomenological analysis which focuses on experiences and understanding experiences and the meaning that are attached to those um, by the participants and that again was a really key thing for um, the study and um, I was studying my own students, students that I worked with on a regular basis so it was quite important to me that they um, were supported to feel that they could be honest in, in their responses or as much as you can do that um, and so there were a couple of things that I put in place for that in terms of the online an anonymous um, questionnaire using independent facilitators, neutral locations away from the university um, to try and help them with that. And then the participants for the study were, um, as I'd said earlier, from initial teacher education and, and, and PE graduates, there were um, 25 participants in the uh, focus group, 11 in the interviews, and I don't know why the number's not in there, but there were 39 in the survey, um, which was about 80% of the potential participants um, and it was they were purposely selected from um, PE graduates in initial teacher education. So the kind of sample of uh, results that I'm going to, or findings that I'm going to present to you are really focusing in on some key factors that seem to influence their um, levels of preparedness. All of the participants in the study either agreed or strongly agreed that they were prepared for entering their probationary year and they felt like they um, were ready to move on and, and, and take the next step in their career. Um, when they were asked very specifically about how they pre were prepared to meet their responsibility for health and wellbeing, that's where we started to see a little bit of variation in that they showed um, less or lower levels of preparedness, but it's important to note that they never said they were unprepared and um, there was just a variation in that not as many strongly agreed and, and not as many agreed and, and we saw a few more in the kind of neutral category um, when asked to, to talk about that. For almost all the participants, um, physical education was offered as being synonymous with health and wellbeing, um, and this made them feel prepared to go out and meet that responsibility, um, despite the variation um, that, that was shared uh, by the participants. They shared lots of factors that impacted their preparedness um, the four that are here on the screen were the ones that were um, most frequently mentioned or talked about in the different stages of uh, data collection. 
or the ones where the participants really attach some significant meaning to them um, and help them understand their experiences. So, as the previous slide had indicated, the PD and health and well-being was offered as being synonymous by quite a lot of the participants. Um, and the meaning that they attached to that was that because the subject-specific lectures, the practical activities, the content that they got from that in physical education made them feel like they could do their uh, job, that they could be a teacher, and subsequently they were then able to meet that responsibility. And alongside that, placement had great value for the um, participants, and that's not new information. I think most of us would know that placement experiences and have a significant place in teacher education, but for these particular students, it was the ability to apply their learning to a particular context and to think about what health and well-being meant in that context. And that's why the, the next one there context is so important for the participants in the study. They really felt like knowing the context, knowing where people, knowing what they were teaching, knowing the school, the community, and um, the context within which they were working um, made them either feel more or less prepared, depending on how much they knew about that context. And then the final one there um, was about the support that they got from tutors and formative assessment and feedback that they got from colleagues within school. And that helped them to feel more prepared because they were either being encouraged to develop things or being um, encouraged to continue progressing um, or being reinforced that they were actually doing um, what was expected of them. I have a couple of quotes there from a couple of the participants, um, and specifically with health and well-being, when they were asked about how prepared they felt to meet their responsibility, context and experience, or the experiences that they had, seemed to really matter to the participants. Um, and you can see there from Calvin, not his real name, um, he's talking about when he left, he felt quite happy with what he was doing, he felt like he was about able to, to go and teach, but because he didn't know his school um, or his pupils, he, was not, he wasn't fully ready, um, but he does acknowledge that he potentially could never be fully ready until he was in his school doing it. And then for Jessica, um, she kind of showed that experience changes perception for her, so when she left university, she felt 100% ready. Um, but now that she's completed her probation year, she's looking back and she's reflecting and she's saying that actually maybe I wasn't as ready as I thought I was or I wasn't prepared as I thought I was. Um, and she acknowledges again that she might never ever get to that 100% feeling of preparedness um, in that sense. And that's where we get to the kind of title of this presentation and what was presented in across participants was this idea that as they understood more, they began to feel a little bit less prepared. And this was predominantly seen in the reflective interviews, having had their probation year and moving back or reflecting back on what they had said and their experiences from earlier in the, the study. And it's this idea that as they begin to understand the reality of health and well-being and what it looks like in the context that they're working in, um, they began to feel a little bit less prepared than perhaps they had originally thought they were. And I think again here it's important to notice that they, none of the participants said that they didn't feel prepared, but just that the preparation changed as a result of um, a broader understanding of how to work with um, Here we can see a couple of examples of that. Um, Jamie, in one of the reflective interviews um, at the end of his probation year, kind of acknowledging that he was really just realising all that you had to do, that it was more than just the physical. Um, and more, he acknowledges that more could have been done when he was in university. And then Derek talking about his understanding of him and um, he wasn't really able to articulate what he understood him and well being to be, but he was able to get some really practical examples for his context um, in terms of breakfast clubs and health. And that was the other thing that we saw was that as they developed and um, their understanding, they began to see that maybe there was a lot more to it and they didn't really know everything about health and well-being as a young practitioner. So what does all of this really mean, those kind of key points that we've been taking there? And I think one of the really big things is that perhaps knowing more about the context in which they were going to be teaching might have helped them increase their preparedness. Um, perhaps looking at initial teacher education, supporting teachers, um, 
and detail coordinate our understanding of their people. And as a result of that, maybe some considerations should be given to how the factors that appear to increase the cohesion and can be emphasized and approved and their IT and onto and the reduction of their graduates and lots of them are already included there, but perhaps we could find out on the put them in a different way or give a different significance to them. So in that sense, I think maybe more could be done and to give them the extension of experience Studies perhaps need to explore you know, what they understand, how they're going to be in practice, what their responsibility is, and, and how that will impact the feelings of the preparedness. There's some of the references there, and there's the show, and the show is slideshow. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to consider those in the chat. Thanks, Elaine. Um, there was a slight problem with your sound, so I'm not sure if there's a couple of people I think have their mics on. It could well be uh, that that's the problem. Uh, we got most of your presentation, so thanks. That was really interesting. But again, what we'll try and do is try and get your details out to people so that um, if anybody has, you know, would like to know more about your research, then they can get in touch with you. So our next presentation, hopefully Mike's around and he's about to um, share his slides. Uh, Mike Jess from the University of Edinburgh, along with colleagues, they're going to present the final presentation today. Um, and then the presentation is entitled Complex Nature of Teachers' Personal Visions for PE. And so they're going to present their findings from the first phase of a longitudinal study that focuses on the professional visions of final year physical education students. Mike, when you're ready, it's over to you. Thanks, Shelley. Can you hear just your response, Shelley? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. That's nice and clear. Can anyone see me? No, I can. Yeah, we can see you too. All right, cool. I started to panic there though because David just put up a slide to make sure Mike is mute, which didn't really help me. Um, however, on we go. For the last five or six years, the issue of personal vision has become a sort of topic that we've been really grappling with, not just in the course that I'm going to talk about, but across our whole degree at Edinburgh. Um, and it's something that we're now starting to study um, in a way that probably a year or two ago, I didn't think that we would actually get to. And as Shirley just said, this presentation focuses on the, on the early stage of a longitudinal study that we've just actually started. Can I just do one thing before we go here? Sorry, everybody. Okay. Um, I suppose the first question is why personal vision? And as we've worked our way through this, I think it's become increasingly clear on two fronts that PE is not a static subject. It's, it's, it's a subject area that's always becoming, it's always been becoming. And certainly in the, in the last couple of decades, we've seen more disciplinary and curriculum approaches becoming evident across, not just, or just across the whole world, really. Um, secondly, with governments becoming increasingly neoliberal, we're seeing a range of new stakeholders actually engaging with physical education in a way that they didn't do before. So we've got this subject that is now incredibly messy with many, many different parts to it. And for teachers, there's always this becoming to keep up to date. So teachers are never static, but they're always working, A, to keep up to date and B, to develop as professionals as they work their way through. And I would argue this century for our profession becomes incredibly important. And because the subject is so complex, the importance of integrating ideas from different disciplines, approaches, and developing a coherent vision is important, I think, A, for individual teachers in their professional development, but also, I think, in the, in the longer term, for the subject area for its own development. So developing vision 
I think is an incredibly important part of the, the, the story for our teachers. What do we mean by personal vision? So we've used Karen Hammers, Hammerness's work quite a bit here. And she says that vision consists of images of what teachers hope could be or might be in, and this is important, not just their classrooms, but their schools, their community, and in some cases, even society. So vision can provide a sense of reach that inspires and motivates teachers and invites them to reflect upon their work. So this means that vision helps develop a picture of what might be achieved in the class, how teachers might negotiate and extend policy at that sort of macro level. And Shulman and Shulman have suggested that vision is really at the heart of teachers' development because of that interplay, not only within, but between the teacher as the individual, the school context, but also the policy levels. And there's also a suggestion that vision is a really important part for teachers to combat the neoliberal government's attempt to restrict and control teachers' voice. So I think the issue of teacher vision, and although it's been maybe about for 20, 30 years as an area of study, I think it's becoming increasingly important as part of the, the narrative of our profession. And as Hammerness said a bit later, if we don't know where you're going, any path will do. So with that sort of quickly as background, the, we've started a longitudinal project um, begin, begin, beginning by tracking the students on the MA in PE. And for those of you that don't know, the MA in PE in Edinburgh is a four year undergraduate degree and we have about 100, 100 plus students per year. And importantly, from that sort of complex mixed perspective, students who study on the programme look at PE curriculum and pedagogy in every year of the programme, sport and exercise science, physical culture and educational studies, as well as actually going out onto school placements for over 30 weeks of the year. So again, the students there are getting this very complex mix from different aspects. We located the study as in this very early phase in the final PECP course in year four. And over a number of years, it's taken us quite a while to, to get it the way we would like it to be. We focus on the students' investigation and articulation of their personal visions for physical education. And we do that um, within an ecological perspective. So trying to help the students understand the different individual task and environmental factors that influence their vision. So that's been the sort of driver that, that has evolved over a number of years. For this first study, we've taken data from 20 of the final year student essays. Now that's about 25% of the, the final year of students. It's a 300, 3000 word essay that was focused on three related topics their personal visions for PE, their experiences that most influenced, but also their professional development plan focused on how they would enact their vision in their early career. And I'll talk a bit more later about some of the issues that obviously we are, we are conscious of by using an essay as, as data. But part of the process was that we had regular sessions um, to support this as an open-ended task. And what we certainly were not asking the students was to tell us what we heard, uh, sorry, what we wanted to hear. Um, and like a key part of that was students working in, in pairs to develop a poster about their shared notion of what their visions of physical, educa might, physical education might be. In terms of the essays, we, we purposely selected the 20, um, looking at, for a breadth across the different visions, some form of internal uh, coherence across the different subcomponents, so that really the, the, the visions stood together or hung together. And we also looked for some clarity in the essay for the reader. In retrospect, we maybe could have been a bit broader th than we were, and I'll touch on that later. Um, but that gave us, we were very much looking for a starting point and that's what these essays were about. 
we went through a sort of five step process to, to analyze the data um, and look at the influence from a task, individual and environmental perspective and how these impacted and influences the visions presented. We did start with a notion of using complexity ideas and um, or complexity principles, but that became a little bit un un unwieldy. So that the process of analysis took us quite a while to, to, to nail down what we were looking for. And in those findings, we identified three key themes kept emerging. That the students' visions were educationally focused, they were theoretically informed, and they were shaped by a range of ecological factors from the past and from the present, but also, and there was a significant acknowledgement of what the future may hold for them. And I'll just talk about each of these three aspects in a little bit more detail. Overall, from the 20, there were four overarching visions. And perhaps not surprisingly, 12 of those came from the idea of developing a foundation for lifelong engagement in physical activity. Five of them were very focused on the idea of holistic learning, two in inclusion, and one looked very closely and in detail at adaptive practice. So although there was a bit of a range there, what became really interesting was that as we sort of drilled into the subcomponents, it was quite clear that there was a wide range of broad educational components that made up these different visions. And as you can see there, personalization, critical thinking, transferable skills, um, engagement, all were presented in different ways. And what was key to this, or certainly became of, of perhaps interest and surprise to us, that no student, none of the 20 presented exactly the same subcomponents as any of the other students. So what was becoming clear was that these visions were similar-ish, but a bit different. And I think to a surprise, and I suppose looking back, because it was a final year project or final year study, um, theory played a role. I don't think we were expecting the students to use as much theory as they actually did. But as you can see there, some constructs and principles were used to inform the way they viewed their vision for PE, meaningfulness, physical literacy, masculinity, complexity, talent development. So the whole self-determination that was talked about earlier. Um, so there was, a, there was clearly different takes on how these visions were being informed. And therefore the overarching visions, they might be similar, but there was different subcomponents within these there was different theoretical principles informing them. And also, which I've not really highlighted, but if we particularly take meaningfulness, a lot of these subcomponents were actually interpreted a bit differently by the students. So I think what's quite clear is that although there's some form of similarity, there is clearly a wide range of different ideas as to what physical education might look like in the future. In terms of the ecological influences, I've just put this up to briefly say it was this mix of individual influences, environmental and task influences. The individual factor, um, that was a little bit disappointing to some extent. The majority revealed a deep connection with the past and current experiences and also the, the various people who'd influenced them. Most of them looked at very positive experiences that influenced them very strongly individually. But actually, I don't think we were able to drill down and look at the sort of personal characteristics, particularly the social and emotional that influenced them. In terms of the environmental influences, this was an interesting one because we saw different layers and different levels of the environmental influences being highlighted. This one direct quote in this slide and the next one comes from student number seven. The student talked about ITE. Not only has my initial teacher education shaped my vision into its current form, I believe it's equipped me with the tools to successfully uphold my vision for PE, viewing health as a holistic concept 
in my first year of teaching. But also, this student talked about the demands of the school context. My placement experience during my second year wasn't very good. My vision for holistic PE was not achievable within that context. And I even felt that the appropriate decision was to leave. But her third year, or his or her third year placement was very supportive. And that helped her start to enact the vision. But also there's an acknowledgement of the national policy context where the policies show an educational shift towards teaching the whole child. And the student strongly argues that to develop P holistically and promote well-being, learning experiences must be meaningful and relevant. So you see how these environmental influences are actually have an impact on the student. And the final point would be the task influences. Now we were conscious of the constraints of a 3,000 word academic essay. Um, but what became clear were the students' ability to synthesize their thinking. And they revealed this connection between the purpose of their personal visions, the ways that these visions would be enacted in practice, and also the likelihood that personal visions would need to be adapted, possibly radically, as they moved into the real world of teaching. And that was quite encouraging because we were concerned that they would just be, that the, the essays may be a bit all over the place. But that was an encouraging part of how they responded to that task. So therefore, as I said at the beginning, personal vision for teachers, I think, becomes a very important driver as we work our way down the road. We were reported here on the early phase of this longitudinal project starting with student teachers, key similarities, but obviously differences, educational focus and theoretically informed and numerous ecological factors influencing the students. And I think this sets the foundation to track these students as they work their way into the real world of teaching. So finally, next steps, yes, we're going to track, uh, track these students as they move into teachers, we will continue to develop this line with the fourth year students, but also introduce the notion of personal vision with the first years. And I think we need to consider from a data collection process or perspective, how we actually start to drill in to some of the thinking of the students. That's me, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, that was really interesting. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Rachel Sanford uh, now. She's the co-convener of the NW18 network. She's going to bring some of the key ideas from the presentations together. But just before I do that, could I just invite you to think of any questions you might have? Use the chat function here in Zoom. And once um, Rachel's brought some of the key ideas together, hopefully we can have some discussion around the presentations. Okay, Rachel? Rachel, are you there? I think Rachel is just having some technical difficulties. So uh, yeah. perhaps we could take some questions now just uh, while Rachel sorts those out. That's fine. Yeah. I am here at the oh. moment. What did you ask me to do? <laughs> so you're going to bring some of the key ideas to uh, some sort can of... Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you now, yeah. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, it says it's... Step for, um, yeah, my connection's really unstable. It might kick me out again. I'll keep okay, Well, if that happens, what we'll do is we'll go to Ollie and Ollie will, will field some of the questions. Is that okay? Okay, Ollie, do you want to just field some of the questions just now? And can I ask I the I presenters to, to um, just be ready to answer if the questions are directed towards them? Is that okay, Ollie? Yeah, that's fine, Shirley. You want, um, wanting me to keep going? No, I think we'll maybe come back to you, Rachel. <laughs> okay, everyone. So, uh, yeah, presenters, if you're ready to take some questions, we'll go in order. And if anybody else does have any other questions they'd like to ask, please do feel free to put those um, in the chat function. Um, so one of the first questions we got asked, I think going back to your presentation, Andrew, um, was from Don Tollen. 
and he asked, do you think that after 10 years, PE's place and role in the school curriculum should be reviewed and re-evaluated? So what are your thoughts on that one, Andrew? Andrew, are you there? <laughs> It was all going so well. Hello, hello. Sorry, yeah. do, um, I think I've done the right thing here. Uh, yes, it was a, I'm sharing the space with everybody in the background. It's quite a bit of background noise. I've just fixed that. Uh, thanks for that question. It's quite a challenge to to know how to um, to respond to that. I, mean, I think it's already being reviewed, and I think a number of people's views about what we can achieve and what we are happening is going on. I, I'm certainly curriculum for excellence in Scotland is uh, due for a review and that's happening right now. Um, I don't think there's a particular problem with health and well-being. I think that that's something that teachers are now settling down to think about what they need to do uh, and how they go about it and, and I think it's perhaps in many schools taking uh, even more of a central role than it has done. It's quite interesting how in this period of COVID people have really valued that ability to you know, to exercise and to do things and to find meaning in movement and that's just as that's really important so I, I don't know if that's answered the question to the fullest extent but that's, a, that's my first go at it okay Andrew then we'll stay with you for another question um, that Anna Bryant posed and that was given that Wales are a couple of years behind Scotland in terms of curriculum reform what tips or lessons might you be able to share for PE ITE um, within the health and well-being context based on some of your research? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, again, a great question. And I think the presentation Mike's given uh, shows how we've, we've approached some of that within our IT programme to get students to realise that they, they have to have a vision about what health and well-being means for them. They've also got to engage with that and be aware of all the different uh, um, discourses that surround that so that they can uh, be very skilled to advocate for physical education uh, and also aware of all the things that are happening uh, and operating at different levels. And I think we've learned a lot from that uh, work. And that's, again, I also have had some types of teaching that course that Mike was talking about. Um, and, I, and I think that's a bit, we've, we've kind of got to, in initial teacher education, show how there's more than one form of health and really the well-being aspect is an area where we've, we've got to look at that as well. So I hope that's, again, some form of answer and maybe there's probably other things I can think of with a bit more time. I'll pause there because I'll be lots of get through. Perfect. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, I'll move on now and I've got a question then for David and Cara. I'll let you decide which of you is better placed to answer this. Um, and it came from Joao Costa. And that was, did your data show an incompatibility between explicit instruction and the teacher's intentions towards elements of a pedagogy of affect? If so, do you see that this is an authentic or a constructed incompatibility? Cara, do you want to have a first go at that? Um, I need more clarification on the question um, because I didn't really, that would be more of Asian research, I think. I'm just wondering if it was to a specific program we had. Joao, sure, by all means, feel free to clarify that. Uh, I, uh, sorry, I'm here just with the kids just trying to follow the presentation, sorry. Uh, I, I, what I was trying to ask was about the part that David presented uh, with a more control and more direct instruction from the teachers with the qualitative part in terms of the intentions of, each of those teachers towards the pedagogy of, of effect. So uh, David highlighted those three cases and I was looking at the one to the far right. I think that was the one showing more control if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So that's, what, that, that's the sort of case that I'm thinking those teachers with more, you know, more controlled practice, w w did they show any, or any sort of incompa incompatibility with their intentions for the pedagogy of effect, which is more democratic and more open in nature? Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, and I think Asian's answer to this would be yes, that they, the teachers um, 
had an aspiration to teach for um, effective learning outcomes, but there, um, this one particular teacher I've got in mind was very directive in terms of, of um, you know, um, asking questions that were yes, no answers, um, not open-ended answers. Um, it, that, was, that was an extreme case, mind you. Um, and there were very few other teachers who were to that far um, <clears throat> along the continuum of controlled teaching. And you'll notice that none of the teachers were in the top right hand um, box. So I, th I think what we can probably say with some confidence is that if you're teaching for um, effective learning outcomes, then you can't be, um, you can't be highly controlled teacher um, with also um, high levels of support. It, that seems to be incompatible. Hey, thank you for that, David and Cara. Um, I'm going to move on then and take a question for Elaine now, and that came from um, Shirley, actually. Um, and Elaine, um, so, so what next for you, really? How has your research influenced what you do now with your students? Excellent question there. Um, I think probably there's a couple of key ways that it's influenced what I am doing with my students, obviously. Um, involved heavily in the delivery of the programme for initial teacher education and therefore even on a week-to-week class-to-class basis and um, there are things that we put in place and I guess a couple of the examples would be the the students had kind of shown that they um, wanted to explore the experiences and outcomes more to help them develop their understanding more and then be able to apply that in practice and so from a very practical standpoint we did some micro teaching where they were asked to teach a lesson that had a health and well-being focus and then we reflected on it and we um, spoke about how that then um, might help them understand a little bit more about um, their health and well-being development and then because experience was so important to them we've done a lot of work in helping them making sense of their experiences through reflection um, and using some of the field work to help them look at their work through different lenses um, so that they're not only just having the experience, they're trying to make sense of that and then hopefully that then leads to kind of higher levels of preparedness um, and then I guess alongside that again from a, a kind of almost very practical standpoint there were certain things that they wish they had known earlier on in their, uh, their kind of development initial teacher education so we've reflected on the the order in which we teach things and the connections that we make between those to try and perhaps support the student teachers coming through the programme to develop a broader understanding of health and well-being and develop higher levels of preparedness um, throughout that. But I think kind of in long term I probably would like to revisit the students who were part of the study maybe kind of four or five years from now and see what their feelings are about their preparedness you know further down in their journey. But um, those are a couple of examples of how that's changed the practice within the program and, and the university based on the, the views of the participants. Perfect. Thank you, Elaine. I'm going to skip around the questions a little bit just to make sure that we can ask uh, one or two of each presenter. So I'm going to come to Mike next um, with a question from David Aldous. Um, and, and that is, Mike, to what extent do the personal visions of the students reproduce existing discourses or visions of physical education? And in what ways can your programme provide alternative visions or possibilities and new ideas? I saw, I saw that question and it's, it's got me really thinking. I, I think um, given the point that I made that the, the students in, from a sort of overarching perspective had a, had a picture, I think, of where they saw it going. But the fact that they use so many different sort of educational and theoretical sort of subcomponents. I think part of what we're really trying to do is get them to grapple, get them to feel confident enough to try and, you know, and, and sort of it's, it's okay to have a go at this. And, and that's very difficult, I think, as part of a fourth year or final year essay. Um, and, and I think certainly when we sat down and we did the analysis, we, we were a bit surprised as to how um, prepared they were to, to sort of try and synthesize in their own way. Um, and, and that's something that I think we'll be hoping to, to see, I think, as we work our way through. Um, one of the things I didn't say is that 
were very interested in this idea of PE teachers being border or boundary crossers. Um, and, and we tried to get that message over to them that they, they were really trying to make something coherent, but actually pick the bits that, that made sense to them. So it's sort of quite a complex process. In terms of moving outside the box, um, I think I think change is usually quite a, a slow process. Um, and I'd like to think that we're moving in a direction where we can start to get people looking at alternative ideas. Um, and certainly if I go back over 15, 20 years, working 20 years plus in Edinburgh, um, I think we've seen a, a gradual opening um, of the vision of what physical education may be in the future. Um, are we going alternative yet? Mm, I don't think so, but I think that would be interesting um, to explore that possibility down the road. And of course, just my last point there is that if you go too alternative and too wide, is, is that the time to do it in the undergraduate programme for discussion? Mm -hmm. We've got them for four years, though, so it's it, it's a really interesting conundrum to have. That's... Thanks for that, Mike. Okay, uh, just take one final question before we go over to Rachel to close out this session. I'm going to take um, Michelle Fleming's question, and that's open to any of the presenters, so please do feel free to um, share with us your thoughts. And that's a question, I guess, looking at does health and well-being include mental health? And what does this look like in terms of curriculum design and pedagogical practice, I guess, in that Scottish context? Is that a question for everybody? For anybody. I'll just throw in, I think it's become part of the narrative. I think it's, you know, with PE moving into health and well-being, um, mental health, which has become more apparent in terms of out in the public domain. Um, it's certainly a bigger part of the story of what primary PE, or primary PE they are, uh, primary and secondary PE is. But I see Andrew, I see his face, so he's going to speak. Oh, well, thanks Mike. Um, certainly the curriculum leaders, uh, even at the start, when curriculum practice was coming in, in play, that was one of the aspects that the, particularly because aspects of the inspection framework didn't talk about uh, health and well-being per se. They talked about care and welfare, and they talked about these other aspects. Most of the planning that the curriculum leaders were doing was also about how they could connect to other projects that were happening in the schools so that they could support you know, health as holistically as possible, because again, you wanted not to be seen or bracketed as just the P department that was going to just do some sort of physical part. They wanted to, to make sure that everything was doing was really uh, nurturing and supporting, you know, a holistic view of, of, of children in the school. So I think, I, I think our teachers um, across the board want more support. Uh, and, and want to try and think more about how the actions and activities that they undertake in lessons and the interactions they have support and promote good mental health. That's sometimes a challenge to know how to do that, um, but it's certainly something that is uh, you know, it's going, uh, well, there's a lot of work in that area and being undertaken. Um, thanks for the question, Michelle. Um, nice to see you here, or not, but wherever you are. Um, uh, uh, you know, just building on the answers that have um, come so far, tying this back into the, the precarity issue, there's no question that we're seeing a rise in um, mental health issues with um, young people, and they're presenting at schools. Um, Guy Standing talks about the four A's of, of, um, of um, precarity and its effects on health and well-being of anger, alienation, anxiety and anomie. Um, and so young people are coming to schools with, with these issues. We don't know the prevalence of this in schools. And in fact, um, uh, with Shirley and, and another colleague, we've been trying to, to, to get some research funding to, to study this. Um, but given the fact that Asian managed to find as many teachers as he did uh, who were self-identifying as teachers of physical education who were interested in 
the effective domain, in, interested in what is in Scotland's called personal qualities, I think um, speaks for itself in the sense that teachers teachers are, are, are taking are, they've got spaces to manoeuvre within this curriculum, and they're using those spaces to meet the needs as they perceive them of their of their kids. So um, whilst there might not be a fully sort of worked out program for mental health and physical education, but certainly I think um, um, on the ground teachers are recognising the need that precarity is is raising. And just to touch on the COVID issue that I think Wesley raised, um, there's no question that all of us have had a taste of precarity in the last um, seven or eight months um, around the uncertainty of everyday life, the instability, the unpredictability. And this is what lies at the heart of precarity. Thank you for that, David, and to all our um, presenters there for answering those questions. Um, I know we haven't covered all of them, but I'm pretty sure our presenters will be happy to be contacted after if you'd like to follow up on anything. Um, and I think we're going to hand over to Rachel now to try and draw some thoughts together to close out today's session. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ollie. And I am back. And it wasn't really very suspicious uh, leaving before I did lose internet connection, I, I promise. Um, but thank you uh, to all of the presenters today. I think it's been a really interesting session. Um, I do have uh, my huge notes that I was going to talk to, um, but um, I'll maybe just try and summarise a couple of points that I think try and uh, link to some of the things that have been said already, really. Um, so I mean, it's interesting, David's just talked there about precarity. That was my start point, really, um, in that it was to, to think of that notion of precarity in the current context, um, and particularly, you know, with all of the the, the sort of change that's happened, then I think that everybody can really appreciate that sort of fluidity in the landscape that we're in at the moment. Um, but one of the things that I found really interesting um, about all of the presentations really was this idea of context. And I think precarity links to that because precarity helps us uh, to focus our attention on context. Uh, and every presenter today talked about context and how context was important. Um, but what I found um, fascinating really was that context uh, meant different things in different presentations. So uh, it wasn't just simply uh, what is the, the national context in terms of policy, but also what is that uh, local policy in which that um, is enacted. Um, and the idea really, I think, of the health and wellbeing curriculum and the holistic approach really focused in on that context as well. So, so that all linked together for me in terms of, of some of that um, one of the things that I hadn't really looked at earlier when I looked through the presentations, but when people were talking today, uh, really stood out to me was the idea of time scale. Um, and again, perhaps that's something we can all relate to in, in the current climate, but that the idea of context, um, we sometimes uh, perhaps look at in isolation, uh, but the idea of time scale and how that plays out over time is, is something that we perhaps really need to, to look at. Um, and in particular with the Elaine's presentation of the idea of you know seeming prepared at one point and then not prepared at another and actually that timing and time scale was really important there um, and also this idea of relationship and I think the idea of relationships and networks um, really standing out in terms of some of the presentations today um, and that sense that that context really comes into that too um, and the idea of precarity um, sort of has an impact on those relationships and I, and I think again that's you know relates maybe to Wes's question uh, around the impact of COVID on on practice in, in physical education at the moment. Uh, so there was a lot in there today and I say I've, I've got a nice lot of notes that I, I was going to talk to you about but I think we've managed to cover most of those areas within those questions um, and as Ollie said if you've asked a question uh, and it's not been answered then I'm sure that the, the presenters uh, we'll be happy to, to be contacted and ask those questions. Um, perhaps if you're, uh, if you want to drop uh, an email into the chat for people to contact you in case they don't have those. Um, so just really to, to sum it up, thank you again to the presenters and thank you to Shirley uh, for doing all of the, the sort of donation for today. That's been been really good. Um, just to flag really again what Shirley said earlier. This is our our would be Network 18's local context session within. The, the European Conference for Educational Research that, that era we run each year. See, this year it should have been uh, in Glasgow, but we weren't able to do that. So it's been great that we've been able to link with Scott Per Network and, and with CIRA to be able to run this. Um, obviously, if you're interested in any of those networks, please do um, take a look uh, and find out what we do. Uh, we do uh, 
uh, contact details. So if you want to sign up, certainly um, Network 18 has a, a mailing list. I'm not sure about the other organisations, but I, I imagine that's true there too. Um, do try and uh, keep in touch uh, and hopefully we'll be able to meet up again at some point in the future. Certainly from Network 18's point of view, the next conference for ESA is in Geneva next year. Um, and we're very happy to see everybody there who, who wants to come along and hopefully we'll be able to do some of these conversations uh, face to face uh, in the future. Should we have added uh, in this respect? I'm hoping that I haven't just talked to myself for the last two minutes. What but, did you um, say at the end I, there, Rachel? I just missed the very last bit. <laughs> Um, just if you had anything in relation to um, Scott Perth, no, Sarah, but what I'll try and do. I should, I should, I should have um, contact uh, details for all the people who have signed up for this. So I should be able to send slides, perhaps, if that's okay with the presenters, and any other details we can add to that. So that's what I'll do. Okay. okay, and well, I think that's all, all from us today. We'll, we'll leave you to your evenings, but thank you for joining us and um, take care. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.